is uh, Keshav, and, Keshav and, uh, and I'm joined by, by my friend's phone. phone. And this, and is, this the is the fourth, fourth session, session on the, the Feynman's uh, birth, uh, birth anniversary. We have, we have uh, joined uh, earlier, earlier uh, three times, uh, three times and, uh, and uh, have enlightened us about the Feynman's work. Uh, the Feynman who contributed, who contributed in, in uh, uh, quantum field theory, quantum, theory, quantum, quantum electrodynamics, super fluidity, and all, and, uh, all quantum computing, quantum computing and, uh, and uh, various, other uh, various other fields. Uh, in this session, uh, in this we, session we will, will do some uh, interesting, uh, interesting things. things. We will do, we will how, do the concept how the concept of photon arises, arises how, what are the myths that were often taught in our classrooms, how and what that that means uh, uh, bring some bring doubts, some bring doubts, and, some doubts and, 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 and some confusion, some misconceptions, some misconceptions uh, about, the uh, about the behavior of photons. So, so, Professor Oliver Pazon will, will uh, uh, introduce us and, us and clear will those clear those misconceptions in, uh, in this session. For this, I will uh, request my friend Formal to, uh, to uh, uh, tell us about our speaker, Professor Oliver. We are, very uh, we are very thankful as a, as a uh, students of Punjab University, University uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Oliver because, because uh, it is our uh, actually, uh, actually third three times, three times that, uh, that we have already, already met and, and are uh, taking advantage, uh, advantage to interact, to interact with, professor. with Professor. Earlier we have uh, met with him on Feynman's diagram and earlier to that we have met with him on the philosophy of quantum mechanics. So in this time. This time, uh, this time we, we, are, meeting we are meeting with him, with him on the history of photon myths and facts. So I will, so uh, I will uh, request my friend Komal to introduce our audience about the speaker. So please, Komal. So, so please, Komal. Hello everyone. Am I audible to all of you? Uh, uh, I am very elated to introduce our guest of honor, Professor Oliver Pesson, who is the research associate at Working Group for Physics. Uh, he studied physics, mathematics, philosophy, and educational sciences in Wuppertal and received his diploma and PhD in high energy physics uh, doing a data analysis for DELBHI experiment at European Center for High Energy Physics CERN. Uh, he worked as a research associate at Research Center JUIC. In 2008, he completed his internship and worked as a physics and mathematics school teacher in Wuppertal and after that he returned back to academics. He's a research associate at Working Group for Physics and its detected since 2013. He's also associated with project epistemology of Large Hadron Collider and Codal Enigma project. Uh, his area of work and interest are physics education of quantum theory and particle physics, history and philosophy of science, Goethe, uh, Goethe uh, theory of color, methodological question of evidence based education. Uh, he has 600 plus publication in his field and he is also the co author of book Philosophy of Quantum Mechanics. Uh, so guys, let's take the advantage of this interaction and learn as much as possible. Uh, so now listen to Professor Oliver Pesson's talk on history of photon, myths and facts carefully and ask your doubts at the end of the session. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. <laughs> Sir, uh, sir, uh, sir uh, our uh, teacher, uh, Professor Sakshi Gautam has also joined. So, welcome, Sakshi, ma'am. Okay. Oh, yeah. Ma Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. So, uh, uh, almost feels like getting home. So, being again with you. Uh, so, so, maybe my first two talk didn't went too awful. Uh, now, I tried to share 
my slides. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Yes, yes, yes. And the switching. So please, if 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 there are any questions, any technical problems or whatsoever. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We can see. Yeah. If there are any problems or questions, if I'm too slow or too fast, please interrupt me at any time. No. Um, so really, I'm doing this for you, and uh, really, I hope that you enjoy it. I've brought with me a quite a, a complicated story, in fact, uh, the history of the photon or of early quantum theory. But I've picked a catchy title, as you know, Myths and Facts. But in fact, it's, it's actually an appropriate title, I believe. Now, before getting started, let me say a few words on the relation between the history of physics and physics teaching, well, essentially. Now, uh, well, most of you, you guys are, have studied physics or are still studying physics, so assume you would you or recall uh, simply um, you are preparing for an exam on, say, classical electrodynamics. You know, what are you supposed to do? Now, most likely you will uh, look up your lecture notes, I assume, but perhaps you always go, also go to the library and there is no shortage of books on classical electrodynamics. And I've put up here just a few of them. Um, some of them are even regarded classics. For example, the piece by Jackson, for example. Is there, is there Jackson here somewhere? I don't know. Now, the point is, uh, I, I, uh, I assume that nobody of you would, would pick this book. Am I right? So for, for some yes. strange reasons, <laughs> you agree, right? So uh, you see, that, that would be a natural choice in a way, uh, Maxwell's own treatise on uh, electricity and magnetism. Of course, nobody does this. Now, why is that? Now, famously, physics has is taught ahistorically. Um, our, our subject is a typical textbook subject. So we don't uh, look up the primary sources, as people would say in the humanities, or we are not dealing with classical positions, classical here understood as theories which, which are overturned um, by now, which, are, which were held by past heroes. And um, no, this is simply not the way we are, we are learning physics. Now, this sounds negative. Now, actually, I can put it more positive. Physics teaching, and this applies uh, to school and university level, which, and practices, scientific practices of current theories. And as I may add, this is complicated enough, right? And however, the teaching of it is still often framed historically. That is, yeah. Your voice is breaking. My, okay. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I can do much about it. It can make me a bit lo louder. Okay. Yeah, hopefully it works. Um, the teaching is framed historically. There are historical notes in the introduction. The laws and equations we are, we are, we are all learning carry historically la labels, names, Newton's law, Huygens' principles, Maxwell's equations, of course. And then, as a, more, like, as a side note, questions of priority play also a major role. But that would be actually a topic for a different talk. Now, the, the quality of these historical remarks which are typically added in, in textbooks, for example, is often poor. And my concern is not with minor simplifications, with some inaccuracies, which might happen all the time. That is not the real issue here. What I'm referring to has been called quasi-history by, by Mr. Whitaker some m many years ago, actually. This is from this paper here, History and Quasi-History in Physics Education by Whitaker. 
And uh, he deplores that, that the history taught in textbooks is often, well, what historians call a Vic history. That is a history, the history is portrayed or sort of uh, it is told as a, the purposeful development towards the current state of our understanding. So uh, briefly, it's simply a success story which leads to our current understanding. The topics dealt with are typically selected according to our current interest. So there's a complete suppression of the original motives of the, of the historical actors or of the social and economical conditions. Um, there's also typically a, a neglect of all the blind allies of research. It's, it's rather a rational reconstruction which claims to have actually happened. Now, typical examples are, for example, Galileo Galilei, who allegedly climbed the Leaning Tower of Pisa for performing some free fall experiments, which he apparently never did. And there's often the claim that, for example, the, the Michelson-Morley experiments on ether drift pushed Einstein's discovery of special relativity, which is apparently not true either, historically. So this, um, this kind of distortions are my concern today. Now, and there were even some eminent physicists which were rather outspoken in their disregard for, for history. And um, I've brought with me a quote, and you may guess the author. Now, our distinguished author here wrote, by the way, well, he was telling such a, a distorted history, by the way, of the photon. And, um, and he said, by the way, what I have just outlined is what I call a physicist history of physics, which is never correct. What I'm telling you is a sort of conventionalized myth story that the physicists, physicists tell to their students and those students tell to their students and it is not necessarily related to the actual historical development, which I do not really know. So, you may guess who is the author of this quote. It is, of course, our hero. It's Richard Feynman himself, taken from the little book, The Strange Theory of Light and Matter, so his public presentation of quantum electrodynamics, which is a beautiful book, of course, but still. Now, the sort of working de definition of this quasi-history could be the following. It's a, a narrative, a historical narrative, according to which physics proceeds in, in rational discourse based on evidence and, uh, well, a true success story. Students really would like to join in. And, uh, well, historians might argue that, that, is, that it's well, doing harm to the actual course of events. But the physicists would, would argue uh, against that, I assume. They would say, well, perhaps it's poor history, but it is good physics nevertheless. And actually, as a side effect of my presentation, I would like to question this, this claim, this later claim. Um, but, well, get into our story. What is the quasi-history of early quantum theory and, in particular, the photon? So, perhaps I may ask again, is the sound problem some, somewhat resolved? Maybe. Yes, we can hear you properly. Okay, excellent. So. Now, I believe that all of you guys have learned roughly the following, the following story during your studies. Now, the first, first step, quantum theory originated from Planck's explanation of black body radiation in 1900 in order to prevent the ultraviolet catastrophe at high frequencies, he introduced it discontinuous, it discontinuous energies, his famous epsilon equals h times nu. Now, second step, we are usually told, Einstein in 05 applied Planck's idea on light, introduced the light quantum and explained the photoelectric effect. And this effect 
we are told, cannot be explained within the wave theory of light. So truly a, sh a smoking gun for, for light quantum. Now, and then eventually Bohr entered the stage in 1913. He combined Planck and Einstein's insights, electron in his orbit, the planetary motion model of the atom, move on discrete orbits and radiate or absorb photons upon transition between the energy levels. And finally, Compton's discovery and explanation of the effect named after him, that is a, the famous wavelength shift of X-rays which scatter from, from electrons, provided uh, eventually the unquestionable proof of the light quantum hypothesis. And um, now I have introduced a little color code. In the next step, I would like to, to color white all statements which are true well, I put this in in, uh, in in quotation marks. Historic uh, historians, of course, they shy away from the notion of truth. Um, but I mean, we are talking here about something where we have solid evidence. So, so let's we are among us. There's no historian around. So let's let's assume there's something like historical truth. I've made here uh, this color, how the port, lila, um, violet perhaps, the ambiguous statements, the blue ones, I would like to color, uh, the, the disputed ones, I would like to color blue and red, the outright wrong um, statements. So, now all of you may deliver it for a second. What color has the next slide? Well, it should be pretty <laughs> shakered, right? So, that is actually my evaluation. We see a lot of red, a lot of statements which are really simply wrong um, based on the solid historical evidence we do have. But maybe the, the good uh, message first, there is white on the slide. So um, we were not fooled all the time. So, for example, Einstein in 05 introduced the light quantum. That is a true statement. So, and now you see my my talk. Yes, please. Sir, we, we thought uh, all are right. Sorry, once again. Sir, we thought all statements are correct. You were told in, in, in your lecture. And no, sir, uh, actually in books and all, this is given uh, all are right. Uh, okay. All four statements are right. So, so, so you're saying that all, all of my statements are actually contained in your books also, right? Uh, uh, we are told that all these statements are right. Absolutely, yeah. Me too, actually. <laughs> and now comes the surprise. Many of these things are inaccurate or even plainly wrong. That is that is my story, right? So let's move on, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, so you see my my talk now um, structures is, is uh, the, the the organization of my talk now is is, is 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 given right. I go through the list of four items, and to try to correct the stories while I go along. Now, um, but first let's let's uh, let's apply this category of quasi history I have introduced before. Now we are really dealing here with uh, some some uh, line of tradition which is introduced. The energy quantum was interpreted as light quantum. There were the explanation of, 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 of prediction. There were explanations and predictions made, uh, finally experimentally confirmed. So some anomaly triggered new theories. That sounds very satisfying. We have this item, this this famous topos here of unquestionable experimental evidence. So, uh, the, the famous, uh, or, or rather infamous, uh, experimentum crucis and the complete neglect 
of all social, economical and, and, and other factors. So in this sense, it's a typical quasi history. But of course, I need now, I need to fill in the blank now. What, what is actually the, the ambiguity here or the, the falsehood? Now let's start with the first claim. Quantum theory originated from Planck's explanation of black body radiation and his goal was to avoid the famous ultraviolet catastrophe. Now, um, this is, a, well, technically this is the most complicated part of my talk. Let me first recall the notion of black body uh, and black body radiation. Now, a black body is some idealized body which absorbs all, oh, here's something missing, all incident light. Now, he's not reflecting anything. And Kirchhoff, in the middle of the 19th century, already suggested that this spectrum should be uh, some universal universal function called U in the following. Now, being universal, universal in the following sense does not depend on the material and it does not depend on the shape of the body. And that made, of course, black body radiation a perfect a perfect toy for theoretical physics. And, and some years later, Willy Wien could show that actually these functions, these unknown universal function U, is, is something is, it depends on the third power of the frequency and, uh, and the, the, the functional dependence is only nu over t. This is called Wien's displacement law. So, so sort of the, this function is already restricted, but it was still unknown. Um, now, if you look into the books, you find the discussion of mainly three different um, radiation laws named after Rayleigh and Jeans, Planck and Wien. And you see here, you may display them as a function of frequency or wavelength. That's a nonlinear transformation which uh, changes the, the outlook somewhat. And you see the following. The, the so-called Rayleigh genes law, the red curve here, describes the uh, high wavelengths or small uh, frequency regime perfectly. And uh, the black is, uh, is Planck's law. This uh, turned out to be the correct description. So you may uh, look at the black line as actually, actually the, the line of the super precise data. So this is the actual radiation. The Rayleigh genes law at the same time, while describing the, the long wavelength regime perfectly, it diverges at short wavelengths. That is a famous ultraviolet catastrophe. And the Wien law on the other side describes the small wavelengths or high frequency regime perfectly, but showed some discrepancies for, uh, for, for small frequencies. Now, this is, this is, uh, these are the three formulas um, for these laws. So, Raleigh genes, Planck in the middle, and the Wien law. Now, quite a few textbooks suggest that Planck was actually interpolating between these two laws. And in fact, mathematically, this is, this is a proper description. Now, what is, what is here Planck's law? Look, look at Planck's law. We have a, a, a prefactor, colored green, which is common to all laws here. So this is something we can forget about. Now, Planck is characterized by this, by this fraction here. And you have, you, have, you have this E function in the denominator. And if the argument here is, is very small, you may expand it in a Taylor series. series. You throw out everything but the first two terms, and you come up with the Raleigh genes law. So this is simple math, simple, uh, simple math. And on the other side, if the frequencies is very are big, if the exponent here and the e function explodes, you may forget about the minus one, right? E to the x is very big. Minus one makes no big difference. And this brings you to Wien's law. So technically, you see Planck is interpolating between uh, Wien and Raleigh genes. But was this something like this in his notebooks when he came up with this formula in 1900? Now, and this can't be true for a simple reason. The Raleigh genes law was published only in 1905, five years later. 
uh, the Vindor was no, known already. That, that is true. So this already casts some doubt on, on this typical story of interpolation. Now, uh, in fact, historians of, of, of physics made it clear this so-called ultraviolet violet, uh, divergence did not bother Planck at all. Now, this, uh, now technically, this raleigh jeans laws law follows if you apply the equipartition theorem to the classical Maxwell radiation. And equipartition was a debated issue at that time. You may know that the, the rule of Dulon Petit for, for calculating specific heat failed in many times, which is a consequence of equipartition, could not describe all data well, uh, especially the work of, uh, of Martin Klein, famous American historian of physics, made clear that the, the so-called ultraviolet divergence was no concern to Planck. Uh, there's another fun fact, uh, at least written this way, the Wien law already includes uh, the Planck constants H. Now, of course, in, in 90, uh, 1896, when, when Willy Wien wrote down this equation the first time, he chose different letters here, alpha and beta. Um, but technically, the Wien law is actually is kind of a quantum law already, right? Discovered four years before Planck, Planck's work. Now, now how then did Planck uh, arrived at his black body radiation? Now, this is a, a funny story. Now, he was uh, he was um, his main concern was not black body radiation at all. He, he tried to prove the second theorem of thermodynamics. That is actually was his overarching goal. Now, and as some intermediate step, he was looking into black body radiation. He, he modeled the black body as the uh, sum of, of charged oscillators. And then applying Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics, so the classical theory, he could show the following. The mean energy of these oscillators, capital E, is related to the unknown uh, spectral energy density, the U, of the black body radiation. Now, that was uh, a very, very satisfying result. It did not depend on any technical details of the oscillators, for example, its mass and geometry or the like. And uh, unfortunately, this capital E, the mean energy, was unknown as well. However, Planck was a, a very skilled an expert on thermodynamics. So his idea was, well, maybe I can apply this relation from thermodynamics, ds over de is 1 over t, to extract the capital E. Now, that was a brilliant idea, of course. However, the entropy function was unknown, was unknown uh, as well. So, and at this point, in 1899, Planck applied an ad hoc entropy function, which he believed was the only possible to secure the second law of thermodynamics. And this allowed him to derive Wien's law for, for a brief period of time. This so-called Wien radiation law was even called the Wien-Planck radiation law. And so in 1899, he was firmly convinced that he had arrived at a, at a, at a very satisfying uh, derivation of Wien's law, which Wien himself had, has introduced only uh, hand waving these sort of. And in this context, he already introduced actually what later become known as Planck's unit. Um, however, you are well aware of that, um, refined measurements which were conducted in Berlin at the Physikalisch Technische Reichsanstalt, Berlin Charlottenburg, whatever that means. Now, better measurements of the spectrum showed a failure of Wien's law. And this is, uh, uh, this is the data from Luma and Pringsheim from 1899. And already here you see some discrepancy between the well, this is calculated here. This is Wien's. This is uh, the dashed line is Wien's law, and the solid line is the data. 
And then the next year, in the summer of 1900, Rubens and Kohlbaum, some, some other experts from the uh, Physikalisch-Technische Reichsanstalt in Berlin, extended the measurement range even up to 50 micrometers. And, and the temperatures I've quoted here, and they found a large, at large wavelengths that this spectral energy density becomes proportional to the temperature. And, uh, and still a breakdown of Wien's law for high wavelengths, small frequencies, right, as we know. And um, Planck, of course, was very, was shocked, and he had to modify his de derivation. He went back to his desk and he fiddled around, he changed, uh, he modified his entropy function, which, and, and yielded actually a new radiation law published in, in October 1900, which looked like this, and was able to, to fit the data perfectly. Now, up to uh, only you see the constants uh, we are now are still missing. So he had no physical justification for this law at that time. And then the next f few weeks, he spent finding a physical justification for this, uh, trying to find a physical justification. And he eventually reached uh, a go the, his goal and could declare victory on December the 14th, sometimes celebrated as the birthday of quantum physics, he presented his physical justification for the law. Now, as we know, he knew the result already. The data was fitted perfectly with his educated guess. So he had to motivate the, the modified entropy function, which yields via this ds over the e relation, the mean energy, <laughs> which then led to the spectral energy density u, so we call that. And this is the expression for the entropy he needs to, mot to, to motivate. And in order to do so, he applied an idea which, was, uh, which originated with Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, already 30 years earlier. Uh, he used this uh, probabilistic interpretation of ent entropy. So he was actually looking for, the, for ways for, for uh, ways to, for the number of possible distributions of, of energy on the N, capital N, resonators. So that was, so sort of the, the thing was turned into a problem of combinatorics, if you like. And he describes this in a paper, in his paper from 1900. And let me quote from this paper. So he's saying, if capital E is considered to be continuously divisible quantity, this distribution is possible in infinitely many ways. We consider, however, and this is the most essential point, it's the whole calculation, capital E to be composed of a very definite number of equal parts and use there to the constant of nature, h, six times uh, six, uh, times 10 to the minus 27 arc sec. So, this sounds really quantum, right? The most essential point. We have to, to, uh, we have to think of the energy as composed of definite uh, equal parts. He goes on. This constant multiplied by the common frequency nu of the resonators gives us the energy element epsilon and dividing capital E by epsilon, we get the number capital P of energy elements which must be divided over the n resonators. Wow, this is again completely quantum, right? The energy elements epsilon. But then he says, well, the ratio capital E over epsilon, if the ratio is not an integer, we take for capital P an integer in the neighborhood. Wow, isn't that stunning? This is completely non-quantum. He assumes if this thing <laughs> didn't get you an integer, you take simply the integer in the neighborhood, the next integer close by. So something w really weird is going on here. So this is not quantum. Now let's continue his calculation. He says from the theory of permutations, so he looked up some math books apparently, we get the number of all possible complexion, complexion 
complexions, so uh, permutations, complexions. That was the term. And this is the famous n plus p minus 1. Um, oh, how do I pronounce this uh, faculty? Factorial, right. Over n minus 1 factorial p factorial. Now, this thing here, th that is essentially the probability you plug in the formula of, the, of Boltzmann's entropy. You recall, entropy is k times log w. And, um, and then he makes some sufficient uh, approximation, Sterling's rule, blah, 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 calculations whatsoever. Now, now this thing here is important, the red box. Now, uh, Kammerling Ohnes and Ehrenfest gave a beautiful, simple proof for this combinatorics here. And, it's, uh, and we need it, in, and we need this calculation or this, this formula and what follows. So let me go through it simply, quickly. Now, to distribute capital P energy elements, which we call epsilon, on these n oscillators, a problem of combinatorics. Well, it can be viewed as uh, many. How many ways are there to write down a string, which consists of these epsilons and these lines? Now, what are these lines? These lines distinguish simply the boxes, sort of the oscillators, where I put the energy in. So in my example, we have four boxes. So we need three lines, one, two, three, right, which distinguish four boxes. We have five times here, uh, five energy elements. So the total energy is five times the epsilon. So you see I've written five epsilons here. Uh, and this is some random uh, distribution of these epsilons into the boxes. Now, now, the, the, now, now it's really simple. Now, so how many ways are there to write down this string? Such a string contains p times the symbol epsilon and n minus 1 times this symbol line, right? This, 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 uh, uh, this dividing line between two boxes. Now, hence, we have n plus p minus 1 factorial permutations among these symbols. However, if we exchange two epsilons, for example, these two epsilons are exchanged, we arrive at an equivalent distribution, of course. So in order to avoid double counting, one needs to divide out the number of times in which epsilons can be, can be uh, per permutated and these lines can be per permutated. So this gives us the de de denominator. We have to divide out n minus 1 factorial and p factorial. And this gives us exactly the formula in the red box. So this is a beautiful uh, derivation of this uh, uh, combinatorial. Now, the rest was simple. You plug this, this entropy formula uh, in, into the thermodynamic uh, relation. And uh, uh, if you are a skilled mathematician, you can calculate now this expression. You know from Wien's displacement law that the function is a function of frequency over temperature. Oh, so this means this epsilon here must be proportional to the frequency. And this is now this is now exactly the law, um, the black body radiation law of Planck. You know. Now and, and and again the question is this the birth of quantum physics? Um, most most people believe it is, and until the 70s, it was in even the mainstream opinion among historians. But uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote this then this famous book, Black Body Radiation and the Quantum Discontinuity, which um, which is uh, questioning this uh, common wisdom. And we saw already uh, in this remark, pick the next uh, uh, integer in the neighborhood, we saw already that that Planck was perhaps not firmly quantum, or uh, Planck, et cetera, uh, was not firmly in, uh, uh, in the quantum mood already, so to say. And the point is, there are apparently two different readings of this relation. Yeah, you see at the heart of it is this permutation, this combinatorics here, this way, of, this number of ways to distribute the energy on the oscillators. This formula can be read in two different ways. So one reading is the discontinuous reading, I would say. That is the standard reading. This equation then uh, viewed this way. This equation gives a number of permutations to divide capital P discrete energy elements on the capital N resonators. And this 
suggests that the emission and the absorption is a discrete process indeed. So this is the sort of the modern reading. But at the same time, and this is work from Darry Gall uh, I'm quoting here, there is also a, dis, a continuous reading. This equation can be, you can make sense from out, out of this equation also in continuous physics, continuity physics, I should say. Uh, well, why this now? The continuous reading would be the following. This equation gives the number of permutations to divide n resonators on discrete on, uh, uh, on discrete energy cells, taking energy conservation into account. And within each of these cells, the resonators may be placed arbitrarily. And if you view it this way, this suggests that emission and absorption processes are, are continuous still. So you simply provide some sort of structure for the discrete structure for the phase space here. That is the idea. But the, the microphysics itself can still be sort of continuous. It's only discrete structure of the phase space. And this ambiguity, and by the way, makes also plausible why Planck's law was was immediately recognized as, as the correct description of black body radiation, but it did not trigger any debate on quantization. If you look into the period between 1900 and 1905, essentially nobody published on, on these discrete energies. So that, this really remarkable fact. The whole story apparently started only when Einstein entered the scene in his famous 05 paper. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, then Planck's, uh, uh, we can say that Planck looks the, in a Planck's look uh, theory, uh, uh, this entropy function as a, in a continuous way. Planck mostly looked it in a continuous way. We can say that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so one more question, sir. How yeah, the uh, this yeah how the Planck uh, look uh, how the Planck takes this entropy functions to the black body radiation that stuff uh, that UV catastrophe. How Planck take this entropy function to there? Uh, once again, this 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 uh, you you're re referring to the ultraviolet catastrophe. Yeah, so I'm asking that uh, Planck derived uh, this uh, uh, entropy functions by considering uh, charged resonators. So I'm asking, sir, how the Planck uh, took this uh, uh, this entropy function for explaining the black body radiation formula? Like how Planck take this formula and explain that stuff? Then? If the Planck didn't start via uh, via the root. Oh, I'm not certain if I, if I get your point. If I really get your point, I mean, um, I mean, technically. For example, sir. Yeah. Now, if you yeah, follow this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm saying that, uh, sir, in technically in books, we study that Planck derived the formula, that uh, Planck's radiation formula for explaining the black body radiation. But here we are saying that Planck's takes, uh, Planck's was actually uh, taking this as an entropy function for explaining the charged uh, body resonators. So I'm asking that how this entropy function is taken then uh, at that time to explain the black body radiation formula that, that. Well, well, I'm not sure if there's any answer beyond this technical thing that from the entropy you can you can uh, derive the, the mean energy of the oscillator. And these are known to be proportional to the uh, to the uh, spectral energy density of a black body. So, but this is, this is well, this is, uh, if you like, this is technical, right? Um, but, but my claim, I would suggest that he was sort of agnostic about the microscopic processes here. That would be my, my understanding of Planck's work. But I mean, technically, as I, as I try to explain, technically from the entropy function, you get the mean energy of the oscillators, and from the mean energy of the oscillators, you get the black body law. But maybe I'm missing here something. Okay, sir, I'm getting the, your point. So also, yeah. sir, I want to 
one comment sir uh, this is good sir I, actually in uh, various textbook in fact in standard textbook like the iceberg quantum theory of atoms molecules and they uh, introduce like that that uh, the planks tried to uh, write that formula for explaining the black hole radiation that was interesting to get that he didn't uh, he derived in another way approach mm -hmm. thank you sir yeah um no especially this interpolation story is often told P people are really often missing the point that the rally rally genes law was discovered only in 05 and published only in 05 i mean might have been in the minds of many before that of course but um but oh, yeah sure so so let's move on to to einstein and the, and the distortion of, of the history here we are typically told, or I was told also when I studied physics, that Einstein in 05 ply, applied Planck's ideas on on, the, on, uh, on light, right? He used the, the discrete energies Planck had in, in his black body, in the, this black body, sort of, in the, the, the discrete energy of his oscillators, and uh, turned them into discrete energies of the light itself, of the radiation itself, in order to explain the... Um, uh, photoelectric effect and you see especially these two issues here are, are uh, colored red so what actually did happen in this 05 paper it's called uh, on a heuristic view, point of view about the creation of uh, and conversion of light ein, ein heuristischer gesichtspunkt die umwand des lichtes betreffen uh, heuristic that means tentative right so this is very careful and interestingly um, these people this paper is very often quoted but apparently it's rarely read. Because if you really look into this piece, and it's online, I mean, it's really not uh, rocket science to look up this paper, you note that the Planck law is quoted only marginally in paragraph two out of nine paragraphs. It is, uh, it, uh, Einstein shows that for, for the large wavelength regime, it turns, it turns into the uh, so-called Rayleigh genes law, which is um, independently derived by Einstein in this paper, by the way. Um, and that is the only time he uses Planck's law. And his argument, his own argument, is completely based on Wien's law. Uh, so this is interesting, not even the, the letter H, the, the Planck constant is not used by Einstein in his 05 paper. Um, so what, what, what is he actually doing? He considers, well, he, he does what, what he could best. I mean, Einstein was such a genius on, on, on statistical physics and studying fluctuation phenomena. And that is exactly what he's doing here. He considers radiation confined in a volume and calculates the probability of this radiation to fluctuate into some sub-volume. And the result then is compared to the fluctuation probability of a gas, of a classical gas containing of n particles. Now, if you have a, a gas of n particles and you ask for the probability that all the gas molecules fluctuate into one part of it, simply given by this expression, that is the probability. I mean, uh, suppose that this um, the sub-volume is, is half of the volume. Then you have one half here, you have n particles, so you have the probability one half that it's in the left half, say, and times one half that the second atom is also in the left half, times, and at the independent probabilities, they multiply. That is the probability for the whole gas to fluctuate into the sub-volume. And for the radiation case, he, he applying Green's law, he arrived at this expression, Einstein, and uh, what are these funny numbers here? This is Avogadro's constant. This is a gas constant. This is a beta from, from Wien's law. And uh, this is technically, mathematically, this is equivalent to h over uh, uh, e over h times nu, uh, times nu. That is true. So this is sort of if you if you uh, you may introduce um, Planck's constant here um, anachronistically, but Einstein did not write it down. But as we have seen before, if you in, in modern notation, Wien, Wien's law already um, includes Planck's constant. 
So, and then, then Einstein could write this, this golden sentence, monochromatic radiation of low density behaves as long as Wien's radiation formula is valid in a thermodynamic sense, as if it consisted of mutually independent energy quanta of magnitude uh, h times nu. Well, what we say today, and, and he said r beta nu over capital N, right? So he used completely different set of constants here. But mathematically, this, this, is, this is equivalent. Now, this is interesting uh, in the first place, right? He did not apply Planck's radiation law at all. Now, what about the photoelectric effect? Now, the, the paper has nine sections, and the last three are dealing with possible application of this idea. Now, the first is Stokes' rule. The second, the last is the ionization of gases by ultraviolet light. And, this, and, and then in the middle, he's also discussing uh, the photoelectric effect, so uh, cathode rays by illuminating of solids. So this is uh, this is true, but is this sort of a marginal point? This is this is uh, this paper of Einstein got famous by uh, and often the name photoelectric effect paper is used. But you see, this uh, whole issue of photoelectricity is only uh, mentioned in passing. Now, um, what did then Einstein thought about Planck's law? This became clear one year later. One year later, he wrote a paper called On the Theory of Light Production and Light Absorption. And it starts with the following. He says, in a study published last year, well, that is the famous heuristic viewpoint I just discussed. In a study published last year, I showed that the maximal theory of electricity in conjunction with the theory of electrons leads to results that contradict the evidence on black body radiation. Ah, what does that mean? Now, he showed in this paper that you have, uh, uh, actually, you would expect classically the Rayleigh genes law, he argues, which has this divergence, the ultraviolet divergence. So, so this is in contradiction. Now, by a route described in the study, I was led to the view that light of frequency nu can only be absorbed or emitted in quanta of energy, where R denotes the absolute, the, the absolute constant of the gas equation applied to one gram, blah, blah, blah. N is the number of actual molecules in a gram, one gram molecule, so the Avogadro number. Beta, the exponential co coefficient of Wien's ah, and Planck's radiation formula. Of course, these are, these are the same. And nu is the frequency. This relationship was developed for a range that corresponds to the range of validity of Wien's radiation formula. So, again, he was dealing only with, with light in a specific range. So he was not even talking about light per se, consisting of, of energy quanta. And then, how is this related to Planck? He, co he goes on to say, at that time, it seemed to me that in a certain respect, Planck's theory of radiation constituted a counterpart to my work. Now, this uh, uh, translation counterpart is maybe, uh, is maybe um, unfortunate. In the German original, ah, I don't recall the, the, the word precisely, but it's more like um, contradiction. It's not counterpart, but it's more, more like contradictory. Now, new considerations, he keeps on, which are being reported in this paper, showed me, however, that the theoretical foundation on which Mr. Planck's radiation theory is based differs from the one that would emerge from Maxwell's theory and the theory of electrons precisely because Planck's theory makes implicit use of the aforementioned hypothesis of light quanta. So, in this one year later paper, Einstein claims that actually light quanta are already implicit in Planck's law. Now, that tells you more about Einstein <laughs> than about Planck's law, as we will see in a minute. You see, now, but the first thing we can take home message at this point is Einstein follows, of course, a discontinuous reading I discussed with respect to the combinatorical formula. And Einstein, as I said, suggested that this, his light quanta corresponds to the energy quanta of Planck. But interestingly, this is, this is incorrect. Why is that now? Um, the point was made convincingly, again, by Ehrenfest and 
Kamerling Honors. I've quoted this piece already. It's a simplified deduction of the formula from theory of com combinations, which Planck uses as a basis of his radiation theory. Right. You recall my part on talking about how, how many ways are there to permute the epsilons and these lines and stuff. Now, this is this beautiful piece from, from 14, 1914, just before the Great War started. And this piece contained an appendix. And this reads the contrast between Planck's hypothesis of energy grades and Einstein's hypothesis of energy quanta. <laughs> so these two guys, they proved Einstein to be wrong. They said, well, there's a contrast between Planck's energy quanta and Einstein's light quanta. Why is that? Now, they write, as a matter of fact, Planck's energy elements were, in that case, almost entirely identified with Einstein's light quanta. And accordingly, it was said, so at that time, apparently, it was said that the difference between Planck and Einstein consists Herein, that the later, that is Einstein, the latter, assumes the existence of mutually independent energy quanta also in empty space, the former, Planck, only in the interior of matter, in the resonators. You, you see, and that is um, pretty much according to the uh, textbook narrative still, right? Like energy quanta of Planck are generalized to be light quanta of Einstein. But this is wrong. Why is that wrong? Ehrenfest and Kamerling Onis make a very simple numerical example. They say, well, assume we have three elements, epsilon, and two resonators. Then, according to Einstein's combinatorics, you have two to the three, that is eight distinguishable, distinguishable distributions. Um, and we've seen before, this is exactly the combinatorics used. He compared, he made this comparison to a classical gas, right? Where, the, in, the, where these are independent probabilities. However, if you apply Planck's combinatorics, you only get four. So I don't know if you have uh, a calculator, uh, electronic calculator handy, so you may, or you may check by hand. This is only four. Now, why is that? This is uh, this is a picture from this uh, from this um, uh, publication. Um, a, B, and C are the three energy three uh, energy elements. One and two labels the two oscillators on which you distribute them. And you see there are eight different ways to do that according to Einstein. So, what does this line mean? It means ah. The first energy uh, uh, energy uh, packet A, say, is, is in, in the box one. B is also in box one. Uh, the, third, uh, the C is also in box one. And here, O, the first um, A is in box one, B is in box one. C, the third, uh, this energy element C is in box two. And, and now you can go on through this uh, to this table. Now, Planck only knows four distinguishable distributions. Why is that? Now, he identifies these three. Why is that? Now, two energy elements in the first box, one in the second. Two in the first box, one in the second. Two in the first box, one in the second. You see, there's no physical difference. Yeah? There's no way to tell, uh, say, experimentally or whatsoever, why these distributions are different, right? So they are taken together. And the same with these three distributions. So, and then you arrive at the four different, at the only four different distributions in the Planck counting scheme. And um, this may sound familiar to some of you in a way to say that these things can't be distinguished is an argument we typically we learn today as part of the debate on distinguishable and indistinguishable particles, right? So in quantum physics, we learn how bosons are indistinguishable, and any permutation among them makes no physical difference. So this is, you see, this is part of the exciting prehistory of indistinguishability. I'm apparently not able to, to pronounce this term properly, but okay, you may understand me still. 
We may summarize, now let's go see how the story ends here with uh, Ehrenfest. We may summarize above as follows. Einstein's hypothesis, his light quantum that is, leads necessarily to formula alpha for the entropy and thus to Wien's radiation formula, not to Planck's. <laughs> so you see, uh, of course, the energy quanta of, of, of uh, the light quanta of Einstein were based on Wien's radiation law. So his combinatorics only gives you Wien's law and not Planck's. Planck's formal device, in, in bracket, distribution of P energy elements over N resonators, cannot be interpreted in the sense of Einstein's light quanta. So you see, there's an important sense in which the light quanta of Einstein are different from Planck's energy quanta. And we would say today, Planck has in a way surprisingly anticipated the whole issue of, of identical particles. Uh, this is really remarkable. Einstein's, however, Einstein's distinguishable and localized light quanta were modeled after the kinetic theory of gas from the 19th century. They do not correspond to the photons which underlie Planck's law, and I may add to the photons as they are understood currently. Um, and, and that is really an exciting point because Einstein's light quantum hypothesis was truly radical and revolutionary. And even to his own judgment, he wrote to a friend, Einstein at that time wrote to a friend, well, I've, I've, I'm about to publish a couple of papers, and one of them is truly revolutionary. And that is his reference to the light quantum. But still, in this respect, it is too classical still. And its rejection, by the way, is more rational than usually assumed. You may know that the light quantum hypothesis was very debated at that time. But this is really a cool argument, which applies still today, <laughs> to say, no, the light quanta do not really make sense, right? As uh, distinguishable entities, they, they give us the wrong distribution for, uh, for black body radiation. So. However, as I said before, the, nobody believed into light quanta anyway. So, and only after the discovery of the Compton effect, the situation changed. Now, this brings me to uh, not immediately to the Compton effect, but I have a third point on my list: Bohr's model. Now, we are usually told, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, I, I, can you repeat again, sir? What, uh, like? Uh, like uh, Einstein, uh, like Einstein uh, bringing the uh, quanta, the concept of quanta, uh, but uh, uh, I don't understand why that was too classical, because uh, yeah. isn't, that, isn't that quantum as quantum concept? Why it is too classical? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, you're good to point. Uh, yeah, um, I, I try to make my point more more precise here. Uh, of course, it's still a radical uh, assumption that energy is, comes in, disc in discrete quanta. Uh, what do I mean by when I say that it's too classical still? The point is that in his paper, he assumed that these quanta are localized. And this is something I didn't didn't mention in my debate, in my discussion. And he, his, his combinatorics is assuming that his quanta are distinguishable. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm not saying that, I mean, Einstein was a genius, but there was, of course, no way in 1905 to anticipate the whole issue of quantum statistics, which started then famously with Bose in uh, only, only uh, 20, 20 years later, right? Um, but still, I mean, if you, if you look at it now, you have to you have to acknowledge the light quanta introduced in 05 were distinguishable, and this is a quanta and and um, so the common narrative that sort of Einstein introduced what we call today a photon is therefore in an important way imprecise, right? So uh, one one thing more, sir. Uh, sir, uh, in books uh, we. We used to study that uh, like uh, like uh, the Planck's quanta. We got that 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 was a different thing, and it was also Planck assumed to be in a classical way. So, but in books we study that uh, 
uh, we used to study in our common books that uh, uh, Einstein uh, bringing the concept of quanta. And other thing is that the well, uh, like the uh, confidence in the concept of quanta photon was brought by uh, by Compton. So, so, sir, what you you want to comment on that? Some like how the more confidence by Compton. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I turn to Compton in a second. So, so maybe we can postpone this this discussion. Okay, okay, but, okay, but, okay. But, but before that, let me make you uh, let me make my brief remark remark on Bohr's model from 1913, this planetary motion model. Now, this this is so easy. To, uh, Bohr was a great man, but in, in this talk, he is not even getting one slide. <laughs> so I'm just making this remark uh, uh, on the flight. Um, we are told in our books, I mean the same in Germany, by the way, I'm, uh, of course, we are told that uh, in the Bohr model, the electrons move on, on discrete orbits, now uh, absolutely correct, and that um, on, on, uh, the, uh, upon transition between these uh, orbits, they radiate or absorb a photon. And it, it is uh, interesting to note that if you read Bohr, Bohr's uh, paper from 1913, 13, you find that he is, um, he tried to stick to the classical radiation theory as close as possible. Uh, Bohr was a known, rejected the light quantum hypothesis until 1925. So there's solid evidence. Bohr rejected the light quantum hypothesis and his radiation was of, uh, obeyed the Bohr frequency condition. Well, that's true. So the energy difference, uh, so the frequency was given by the energy difference uh, of the electrons. Sure, uh, but it was still thought to be classical radiation of this fixed energy. So Bohr had no, did not apply the light quantum hypothesis in this paper. I mean, like many people, I mean, Bohr did not believe in the light quantum for the simple reason that it's extremely hard to make sense of interference effects if you assume that light is not a wave, right? Excuse me, sir. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so as it, Bohr said that if an electron goes from higher energy state to lower energy state, then uh, the energy difference light uh, atom electron emit that uh, amount of energy difference. So, isn't the quanta is coming there, how it is classical then? If it, isn't the quanta there? If, because if the packet of energy, uh, whose, which is, whose energy is equal to E2 minus E1, then it is like quantized energy, it is not continuous. So how well, is, uh, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're right, of course. The energy is quantized in Bohr's model, but he didn't quantize light. And th this is the point I would like to make. No, he he says the light emitted is is, is of this of a specific disc and uh, frequency given by h time nu exactly, but it's classical radiation of this frequency. So the the energy in Bohr's model is quantized, but not light. The radiation itself. I mean, this is a subtle point here, right? I mean, but but recall, I mean, if you are doing classical electrodynamics, you can still, you can build, an, or typically you build antennas which absorb radiation of a specific frequency, right? They are built for, I don't know, some some frequency range, small frequency range to pick up your your cell phone signal or whatever. So, of course, also in classical electrodynamics, you can produce some radiation with some fixed frequency. And that is what Bohr did also in 1913. But he did not, he did not, he, he, he didn't apply the light quantum hypothesis. That was, that was classical radiation in his view, on his view. So this is the point I would like to make here, right? But you are absolutely, but you are absolutely right in terms of energy. It was discrete. Yeah, it's a step to towards quantum theory of matter. Yeah, in terms of energy, it was uh, sort of quantum, but not in terms of radiation. 
uh, but sir, the light that is emitted by the atom is isn't that was in the form of a visible light like vis like we have balmer series uh, the light that that is emitted by the bohr's atom isn't that energy is in the form of light if the energy is quantized then isn't the light has to be quantized no 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 you simply pick now i mean it's like in classical electrodynamics i mean if you have an antenna you can only pick specific frequencies and not others i mean you need to to have special antennas for different frequencies Okay, yeah, you simply okay. are able to to pick one frequency. It does not. I mean, you, you still may believe into a continuous radiation field, but you're not able to, to pick any frequency. Right? So that, I said, yeah. Yeah, you're right, sir. In classical. So that, yeah. So in classical and. Uh, right. Yes, yes. And. Right. right. And at I, that time, in terms of ra radiation theory, Bohr was still a classic. So he writes really verbatim, I try to stick as close as possible to the classical theory of radiation. That is what he writes in 1913. I mean, he is well aware that he is, of course, compromising electrodynamics still, because his atom atomic model uh, assumes some radiation which is not depending on the frequency on the uh, on the orbital frequency of the electrons. Th that is a radical break of Bohr. I mean, Bohr is is radical, right? Bohr is revolutionary. I mean, the electrons emit a frequency which is not related to the orbital frequency of their movement, but only to the energy difference between fixed orbits. Now, that that is a radical break. But that is the, uh, uh, so he was a great man. So that was a, a big accomplishment. But in terms of radiation itself, <laughs> he, he assumed it to be classical still. So that is my modest point here. So One thing more, sir. Ah, absolutely. Sir, uh, it's like in, so there was other postulate of Bohr that uh, the electron can uh, like revolve in only those orbits in which that has an angular momentum as NH nu. So it was also like going in the step of quantum. In, uh, because the electron can only move in where the angular momentum is NH nu, so uh, uh, it cannot move in between orbits where the angular momentum is not NH nu. Mm. So uh, we are getting uh, say like uh, this. We are also getting via this to the quantum, right? Absolutely. I mean, it, it is a quantum. Okay. It, it is the beginning of early quantum theory, right? So Bohr is quantum, of course. He is quantum about matter, but not about radiation. That is the whole right. point here in the discussion. Yeah. But then, Before. right, eventually let's move to the last section, Compton's discovery and explanation of the effect, named after him, provided the unquestionable proof of the light quantum hypothesis. That is, can be found in many textbooks. And this is complete boogie. So let's go through it. It's the Compton effect and the particle nature of light. Now, this is what we learned, for example, at high school in Germany, if you are lucky, on the Compton effect. Oh, is this even a German? <laughs> okay, you have some incoming photon, and you may model uh, the scattering with some electron according to relativistic mechanics. And then you get a wavelength shift, which is in accordance with the experiment. So the wavelength shift of, of, of scattered X-rays can be modeled like uh, interaction of point like photons and electrons. And this, according to the common narrative, provided a strong evidence for the existence of these photons, right? Uh, I mean, in a way, it's funny on its own right. If you see, if, if the wavelength of something shifts, it's supposed to be evidence for its particle nature, well, be that as it may, I always uh, assume that no, Compton sitting in his office and making this calculation and then he finds a result and he, I imagine he's, he's, uh, he's moving out, to the, uh, he's, he's running to his, uh, to his mate and says, well, guy, I found it, it's a, eventually it's a particle, the light, the, uh, the photon, because it changes its, its wavelength. So <laughs> always, I, I think that's a funny dialogue to, to have. Now, anyway, um, this calculation was made in 23 by Compton and also by Peter Debye, 
pretty much the same time, so two years before the discovery of quantum mechanics. So, um, so, so since we would say today, even the notion that the electron is a point particle is sort of compromised in the meantime. Now, um, I've brought with me here a quote from a, from a textbook by Tipler and Lulin, uh, Modern Physics, the fifth edition from 09. Um, there the authors write, it was Compton who suggested the name photon for the light quantum. His discovery and explanation of the quantum, Compton effect earned him a share of the Nobel Prize in 27. So this is a quote from a textbook, for example. And and I was uh, I came about this quote, and I uh, for f funny reasons I looked I, I, I thought well let's look it up. Uh, the Nobel Committee, Nobel Prize has a decent web page, as you can imagine, and that is the entry on the Nobel Prize in 27. And it reads the following: the Nobel Prize in physics was divided equally between Arthur Holly Compton for his discovery of the effect named after him. And Charles Wilson, ah, for the Wilson Chamber. Okay, excellent. Now this is here. Um, Arthur Holly Compton. No, uh, did you uh, have you noted the difference? He awarded. He got awarded the prize for the discovery of the effect, and uh, Wilson and uh, Tipler and Lulin write for the discovery and explanation. No, that makes that's suspicious. So th there's no mentioning of the explanation here. And actually, there's a little story to it. I mean, on receiving the prize in 27, there was, um, this is in this prize-giving ceremony, the Swedish physicist Karl Manne Siegbahn was, um, was, uh, was 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 uh, uh, well. I don't know how to call it. He um, he introduced because uh, he 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 spoke at this prize giving ceremony and described Compton's work. And this is a quote from the speech he delivered at that time. He said he was a representative of the Nobel Committee. Yeah, right. Um, he he wrote the following: the Compton effect has, through the latest evolutions of the atomic theory got rid of the original explanation based upon a corpuscular theory. Hmm. The new wave mechanics, in fact, led as a logical consequence to the mathematical basis of Compton theory. Thus, the effect has gained an acceptable connection with other observations in the sphere of radiation. Now, this is a curious remark. So what is Siegbahn referring to here? Now, he's, of course, referring to Schrödinger's uh, introduction of wave mechanics. And there's a possibility to explain the Compton effect within wave mechanics. And that was published, and I must apologize. That's the only paper I couldn't, I haven't translated. That was published by Schrödinger in 27. This reads here about the Compton effect by Erwin Schrödinger. And uh, he, he writes here, we show that uh, in close resemblance with the results of Bruin, uh, there's a wave mechanical interpretation of the Compton effect, which is as simple as the uh, as the quantum quantish uh, momentum energy uh, conservation calculation typically made. So, so he he provides here a, a, an explanation for the Compton effect within his wave mechanics. And uh, a more readable English um, work on this is given by, uh, was published by Strinat in the 80s, Compton Effect Schrodinger's Treatment here in European Journal of Physics. You may look up this paper. This is pretty, uh, pretty. Um, now, what is happening here? The Compton Effect is explained semi-classically. That is, you may treat the Compton Effect um, applying Schrodinger's wave mechanics. And uh, as you know, of course, Schrodinger's wave mechanics cannot... Um, uh, in, uh, if you if you have uh, if you are dealing with Compton effect or also for electro effect and uh, photoelectric effect in, in Schrödinger's theory, you are typically applying the so-called semi-classical approximation. That is, you use the classical expressions for the electric field and you plug them into the Hamilton operator with the dipole operator. So this is um, so there's no quantization of the of the electric field no, you're, you I mean and that is meant by semi classical treatment right it's classical with respect to the radiation and quantum with respect to 
to matter. And, uh, and, and this works out perfectly for Compton effect, also for, for the photoelectric effect. So this is to say that these effects in, the, in, in themselves, they do not, um, they are no uh, smoking gun for the quantization of the radiation field. So uh, what, what we call photon today, and uh, they are no QED effect. So you don't need Feynman's quantum electrodynamics to, to treat the Compton effect. And uh, now, of course, some of you may object and say, well, this is only the, the, the simple kinematics of the Compton effect. Of course, it's more exciting to look into the differential cross-section. That is, how big is the probability of a certain scattering angle? And this differential cross-section was calculated in 20, published in 29 by Klein and Nishina. This is a famous Klein-Nishina formula for the differential uh, cross-section of Compton scattering. So terrible, uh, complicated. I don't explain to you what these terms means, mean. So now, the, 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 but the important point here is the following. This beautiful treatment was relativistically invariant. It treated the spin of the electron correctly. So this is a still valid result. However, the radiation field in this calculation here is still dealt with semi-classically, that is without photons, without quantization of, of the radiation field. So this, this is curious to note, also this result from 29 is not applying photons. So sort of for photons, sort of with the advent of, of, of quantum mechanics in 25, 26, they sort of disappeared from the scene and they only reappeared later later with quantum electrodynamics. However, as quite different entities. So, and that is my last slide here. The Compton scattering today, uh, a current understanding in terms of quantum field theory, for example, may look like this. Now, this is the famous book here by Peskin and Schröder, uh, um, who in, in, in the section 5.5, they are dealing with the Compton scattering that it the first example where, where also on tree level, two different Feynman diagrams are needed. One where the photon is absorbed before the emittance, and here it's, uh, it's emitted before, uh, before it's absorbed. Oh, this is tr tricky, right? Recall my, my presentation on Feynman diagrams, so don't think hard about this. Now, um, and uh, Pascal and Schröder quote the Klein-Nishima formal I just showed you, and uh, without making any mentioning that this was calculated, this was derived in a completely different framework using the semi-classical approximation. Now the point is, the semi-classical uh, approximation gives you the same result as first-order calculation in quantum electrodynamics, right? And um, However, and this is an important point here, there, certainly there are photons, and these are photon lines, for example, in the Feynman diagram. However, uh, Peskin and Schröder make a nice remark on this, on this particle-like nature of photons. They write, it's quite natural to call these excitations of the field particles since they are discrete entities that have the proper relativistic energy momentum relation. And then they add the following in brackets, by a particle, we do not mean something that must be localized in space. A dagger creates particles in momentum eigenstates. So this is a creation operator from um, quantum electrodynamics, which creates particles in momentum eigenstates, objects which are not localized, so there's no position operator for photons, for example. So you see these are particles in a very abstract sense, not to be confused with, uh, with the photons, for example, of Einstein. So, and this brings me to the end. This was a story, this, this distorted story <coughs> I started with. So I would like to replace, to, to sort of to introduce a better narrative here. So for the first step, we may say the following. In 1900, Planck introduced energy elements, right, to account for the black body spectrum. If he intended a physical quantization is debated among historians of physics. I think it's fair to say this. Now, what about Einstein? Einstein 
Einstein's Light Quantum Hypothesis was based on Wien's radiation law and not on Planck's. The analogy with the kinetic theory, and uh, most important with the, this analogy with kinetic theory of gas, is light quantum should not be confused with, with our current understanding of photons, since they, Einstein's light quantum, were localized and distinguishable. Now, Bohr's atomic model applies ideas of Einstein's theory of specific heat, by the way, I did not mention that. The light quantum was rejected by Bohr until 25. In Bohr's model, the radiation follows the frequency condition, but is treated classically. And finally, Compton, the Compton effect convinced many physicists in the reality of light quanta at that time in 23, 24, yes, 25 even. But with the advent of quantum mechanics, the picture became more differentiated. Here, Compton and photo effect can be explained with the classical radiation field in the semi-classical approximation and genuine QED effects which could be used to motivate the current photon would be for example something like spontaneous emission. Yeah. That is maybe the most simple truly QED effect where you need a photon in current understanding. Right. So this brings me then to my summary and conclusion. You see most textbooks distort the history of, well, not just quantum physics, that's just my case study. And we see in the recall the Feynman quote. Feynman was quite explicit. He did not care about the history at all. Apparently many physicists believe that the contingent factors of history are of no importance at all. And that is maybe the, in the background of this disregard. Now, the quantum mechanical, uh, quantum mechanics photon example I've discuss, discussed today shows that this may even lead to distortion of the underlying physics, especially if you assume that, for example, the photoelectric effect needs photons for its explanation, which is, uh, which is of course, not true. It's no, it's no QED effect. Now, the photon of current understanding is, is, is not the naive particle of light. It is an unlocalized and indistinguishable entity as described by the beautiful theory of quantum electrodynamics. So it's a completely different beast. And I thank you a lot for your kind attention. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, can you explain a little bit about photoelectric effect? How can we explain that using Einstein theory? Is that totally correct? Mm, but, but, uh, oh, but once again, how, how I, we can explain the photoelectric effect? Mm. <laughs> um, sir, using Einstein theory, uh, how um, um, sir, we, uh, we explained photoelectric effect using Einstein theory, is that totally correct or something mixed with it also? Um, Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect, I would say is completely incorrect. The point is Einstein's theory of the Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect. So simply sitting, I mean the notion that there's point-like localized entity which sort of kicks out the electron. It simply is really misguided. You 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 cannot even get the angular distribution of the photoelectrons right. I mean this is really it it, it this this idea of Einstein was of immense importance historically. But I think this explanation of Einstein should be treated in our textbooks like, like Bohr's atomic model. I mean, things which were extremely important at that time and um, extremely important heuristics, if you like, 
but then they were overturned eventually. So the, the, the explanation of the photoelectric effect by, by thinking of by some, some fuzzy ball photon which kicks out electrons is really not, it's, it's, well, it's not our current understanding. It's far from, it's, it's really, it's dangerous, so the, I would say. Hmm? What is the current quantum theoretical, uh, quantum electrodynamic treatment of photoelectric? Well, I would say, I would say the photoelectric effect in itself is no quantum, is no QED effect per se. I would say really you can, I mean, of course you can, um, how should I say? I mean, uh, look up a good textbook on quantum physics like Sakurai. Modern Quantum Physics by Sakurai. Uh, his treatment of the photoelectric effect. I think that is state of the art. I mean, it, it's it's a semi-classical approximation. It can be dealt with in Schrödinger's theory. And you plug in the classical electromagnetic field of the incoming wave. And you get the discrete, it's, it's perturbation theory. It's simple perturbation theory. You get the results right. The energy, energy spectrum and the angular distribution, and and you don't need more. And then you can, if you like, you can carry all these calculations over into quantum electrodynamics. But of course, it's only getting messier. So I think this, as a rule in physics, you you always try to to keep it as simple as possible, right? I mean, if you are if you are building a if you if you are building a, a house, you don't need special relativity, right? You don't, or our mechanical engineers don't need special relativity to for the construction of something, or or if you are engineer and for airplanes, you you don't calculate relativistically, right? Because it's simply not needed. That would be my my picture here. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, I'm just curious to know how the concept of photon were taught in your schools. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you recall from the introduction that I even worked as a school teacher. And so you can, may look into the curricula of, of German high school and we are, we teachers, we are, we are supposed to introduce the photon by the photoelectric effect. So this is, so this result, well, how did I call it a minute ago? I said it was historically important, but technically it's not, the, it's not our current understanding. Technically it's really wrong and gives you the wrong impression of photons as if they were small fuzzy balls which they don't are and uh, and yeah i'm really uh, it's, it's really annoying this is this this tradition of of distorting the 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 history and here in this in this case not only the history of physics but also physics itself is really deep i don't know how to how to fight it so i think that uh, when the students are in high school they learn the uh, photoelectric effect by einstein but mm -hmm. then they go to like uh, study quantum electrodynamics and all they came to know that uh, that, that that theory of uh, fuzzy balls was incorrect and the Einstein theory was incorrect. So I think when students go deep and deep, they came to know. But at that particular time, they don't know. Like in schools, that they don't know. Right? Yeah, but so, would you say that this is a good idea? No, sir, it isn't a good idea. No. But there can't be done. What can we do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my suggestion is really simple. I would say you may teach the photoelectric effect. I mean, it's a beautiful experiment, for example. You can perform it in the classroom. How beautiful, how rare are the experiments in quantum physics you can actually perform, right, in the classroom. Now you can show the experiment 
explain the, the, the explanation of Einstein as you teach the Bohr model, but don't make the impression that this is sort of still the current understanding. I mean, you. I think it's actually quite simple. You may you simply simply uh, acknowledge its historical importance, but also acknowledge that the development moved on, and that these localized objects are not the photons of current understanding. Hmm. I think I would say this is not exactly rocket science, but to, to do that, but. I, so far, I, I couldn't convince any any guy from the from the administration in Germany. Nice, nice. Sir, uh, I also want to add one comment. Sir, that uh, in uh, our schools, uh, like in, I am, we are studying in our masters. So also when we do perform uh, the, uh, the the experiments on photoelectric effect, measuring of Planck's constant, so then also we used to explain the uh, photoelectric effect to our teacher or instructor, uh, our viva taker, via the that photoelectric effect as the fuzzy balls. Uh, yes. So uh, we uh, we uh, came uh, to know that we are explaining wrong things. It is really really nice. Uh, <laughs> and we came to know. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, anyone have questions, please ask. Yes. Meet the course. Satish. I think there is no question. If I, there is, please ask. Or anyone want to add one comment? Okay, sir, uh, let me uh, add some comment from my side. So uh, it is uh, an interesting to know that uh, the how the photon concept was uh, introduced and uh, it was like the mind changing session on the concept of photon. It is completely changed our concept about the history of photon. So as I told you earlier that I have also written articles which is being published, which is being publishing. And I have also introduced in that book in form that I have already studied. So I will also change that part uh, by getting a lightning from you about this concept of photon, how Planck's introduced, how Einstein introduced. Uh, it will be good uh, so that our Indian students also came to know. So uh, thank you very much for this, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great session. Uh, uh, mind, mind changing uh, session. And I am thankful to all of the uh, participants who joined. Uh, this, this was our last session on uh, Feynman birth anniversary. Uh, we used to celebrate it. Uh, every year and celebrating it uh, from the last three years. So thank you for all. Uh, and thank you very much, sir, for joining us three times uh, and uh, finding the uh, uh, time from your uh, from your busy schedule to us. So you want to add some, sir? Yeah, sure. Um, well, very kind words. Thanks for that. Um, part, some of the things I told you are, are published uh, were published by uh, by myself, for example, and uh, and you find references therein. So you may visit my website here in, in the University of Wuppertal, where all of my publications can be downloaded for free. So maybe that's uh, and especially I've written this, uh, something on on uh, on Planck's radiation law and the story I told you t today, for example, has been published. Now, um, well, it's up to me to thank you. I'm uh, I'm glad. Uh, the, um, yeah, thanks again for having me. And uh, well, I hope you all so, the best. So we have also recorded your session this time. So we will also upload it on the YouTube so that other uh, students can also benefit from that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Excellent. So, okay, so we will upload that. And uh, sir, uh, can you suggest some book uh, so that we can uh, uh, read this uh, history uh, like that, uh, history of physics like that, not the conventional way 
in which we used to study in our uh, universities or schools? Well, I came across one quantum physics book by Norbert Straumann. Norbert Straumann, a Swiss physicist, theoretical physicist from Zurich. His book is is in this term in, in terms of history excellent. Um, and I'm pretty sure that he also is is, is uh, pub, uh, also translated in English. Also Straumann is called S T R A U M A N N Straumann. But well, a tough choice, tough choice actually. Um, I'm about to write my own physics textbook on that. <laughs> to, to have one. Uh, so. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. All the best to Goodbye. all of you. Okay. Goodbye. Okay, sir. Goodbye, sir.